This episode of Unspooled is brought to you by Palm. Here is what Palm is. It is incredibly awesome. Palm is a way to be connected to the world when you go out with your phone, with your Verizon phone, without feeling like you have this heavy thing in your pocket that is distracting you from the planet. What Palm is, is it's a tiny thing. It's much tinier than your phone. You can slip it onto your wrist and just go biking, dancing, running around with your friends, and you can silence everything except what you find important to you. If you want to only get your text messages, if you only want to get your Instagram DMs, if you just want to be able to take a couple pictures and upload them, you can do all of that without this heavy thing reminding you of, oh my God, I should really email back my boss. That is Palm. And if you want to learn more about how you can be connected to your phone while leaving it at home, go to palm.com to learn more or go to your nearest Verizon store to check out how you can plunge more into the real world. Palm.com. The year is 1993. Or maybe it's the present or maybe it's the past because it is time to talk about Schindler's List. Everybody and welcome to Unspooled. Paul is in Japan right now with his dad, and I am really enjoying watching his Instagram stories. But that means it is up to me to talk about last week's episode, to talk about Rocky, which, oh God, a lot of people are mad at my opinions about Creed. So it was, well, we'll just let that be. Although Amanda at AHTerrell237, uh, she said that her heart was warmed when I said that Dolph Lundgren was perfect and that she has been trying to explain this for people to, to people for years and nobody gets it. Which, yes, I will go on my rants about Dolph Lundgren being absolutely perfect. I heard this story once that, you know, Dolph Lundgren, he's so beloved for being not just handsome and not just a brilliant scientist and mathematician, that once some people broke into Dolph Lundgren's house and they were like robbing it and they didn't know it was Dolph Lundgren's house. And then they saw a picture of Dolph Lundgren and felt so bad that they stopped robbing his house and just left everything there. Which I don't know how to actually prove that that is true, but I have heard that story many times. And because Dolph Lundgren is so perfect, I'm just going to believe it. Yeah, we talked also a little bit about Rocky and his choice of footwear. And Jenny Bento, at Jenny Bento, she wrote, you know, two Italian-Americans of a certain age, the converse that he wears when he goes jogging, those are the gym shoes of poor kids who can't afford better shoes. And that that scene is, a met, is supposed to convey inner city kid who can't buy proper leather shoes. And when you lay it out like that, Jenny, it makes so much sense. There's something in my head. I think because when I look at movies set in the past of my life, like before my time, I imagine sometimes that choices like that, like the shoes, is just what ordinary people did in 1976 because I haven't asked anybody who was jogging in 1976. I guess it is technically before people started to jog a lot anyways. I think of that as an 80s thing. But anyways, Jenny, thank you for that reminder that a choice like that doesn't mean that that's what everybody wore, which is my default brain. It says something about his character. It's a much smarter choice than I gave it credit for. And yes, duh. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Sean Derman, at Sean Derman, he wrote that further alluding to the high art takes in Rocky, uh, did I know, and I did not know this, that the famous fanfare of the theme is taken directly from a piece from the 15th century. It starts off note for note. So let's just play it. And now, let's get into this week's movie. So, Amy, it's 1993. A movie ticket is $4.14. That's the average cost. The World Wide Web was born at CERN. The first human embryo was cloned. Clinton uh, adopted the don't ask, don't tell policy in the military. This is when we attacked uh, the Branch Davidian cult in Texas. Also, this is when uh, two police officers were convicted in the beating of uh, Rodney King. Uh, Also... A very important year, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is appointed to the Supreme Court. And as far as films are concerned, what a record year. It's Jurassic Park, Mrs. Doubtfire, The Fugitive, The Firm, and of course, Schindler's List. Two of those being directed by the same person. Uh, amazing. Uh, really back to back. It's such Simultaneously a... Simultaneously in a way. Yeah. He's I, I... shooting Schindler's List in Poland and at night going home and looking at the special effects being broadcast on the World Wide Web, I suppose, I or guess. somehow to him. Some from- sort of satellite. You know, like Steven Spielberg had his own satellite for like like uh, editing Jurassic Park, essentially. Wow. <laughs> Could you imagine mentally just going between what you're shooting in this film and then watching dinosaurs in one of the most 
you know, arguably one of the most fun popcorn films of all time. From what I've heard, the experience basically broke him. He was really upset about it. That he, The studio sort of forced it on him. It was kind of like a package deal, like, we'll let you do the Schindler's List. We're cool with you doing the Schindler's List. We're going to make you do Jurassic Park first. Right. And then, you know, please keep working on Jurassic Park while you're shooting your passion project that we all think is going to fail and nobody's going to really care about it. And he said he was super angry that that he would have to, like, go through this hell in the day and then try to focus on these dinosaurs at night. But let's talk a little bit about Schindler's List. Who is in Schindler's List? Schindler's List. You have Liam Neeson as Oscar Schindler. You've got Bang Kingsley as his accountant, Itzhak Stern. You have Rafe Fiennes as Eamon Gert, the evil, evil, evil head, the sinister psychopath, who, from what I hear, is actually even worse in person. We've got Caroline Goodall as Emily Schindler, his wife. And then you have Jonathan Sagal as Paul Dick Pfeifferberg, the man that we'll talk about later because he's the man who basically made this movie happen. And finally... Little teaser, we got our guest, M. Beth Davids, as Helen Hirsch. She's going to be with us later. Yeah, I mean, Schindler's List uh, takes place from 1939 to 1945 in Poland. And it's the story of a German guy, a person who is a member of the Nazi party, showing up in this town, flashing his cash around, asking, acting like he's a little richer, perhaps, even than he was, taking ownership of a factory, using it to make pots and pans, and deciding that, like, if he hires Jewish labor, it'll be cheaper for him, and then slowly realizing that he can actually help people's lives. It's not the first thing he thinks of. It's probably not even the second or third or fifth. But he gets there, and then that's what the movie's about. So, Amy, I think in talking about this film, I'm a little bit nervous because, you know, Schindler's List, to me, feels like an untouchable film. It's number eight on the AFI list. It's number six on the IMDb list. Interesting, very close. You know, and it's a film that... I think is often spoken about like as a weighty, depressing film. You know, it, it, it is a movie that I think, I don't think people are jumping to rewatch this film. And that's a tough thing because it also is a movie. It's not documentary. It, it's a movie and there are things in here that are eliciting laughter and there are things in here that are eliciting emotion on, on many levels. I mean, how do you approach this? You know, you, you're looking at this, obviously as as an audience member, but also as a critic. Like, can you be critical of something that has historical significance? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you 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 have to be in a way because I don't feel like there's such a thing as like a worthy topic, get out of jail card. Right. Do you know what I mean? But it does make it complicated. It might end up, as we're doing this up at the top, like, I like this movie, but yeah. I, I probably will say some things that sound like I'm going hard on it. And I'll also, it's going to be hard for me to deal with the fact that I think Ray Fiennes is so fantastic in this movie that I'm worried my love for him as an actor will ah. show up as love for his character, which is not the case. But I just love him, his performance in this so much. And I think if you didn't have an element of likability or engagement of Gert, the character that Ray Fiennes plays, the movie doesn't work. You ha- He is the lead. He is one of the leads. And... You have to, on some level, want to watch him. And it's interesting because in rewatching it, I don't know if I would have if it wasn't for this uh, re-release and this podcast, you forget how kind of masterful this film is. I mean, Spielberg directing a Holocaust drama is a really interesting combination because he brings, I think, some things to it that I forgot about. Like the beginning of this movie is so kind of beautifully shot and, and exciting in a way. Like you know that you're going into weighty material, but seeing Liam Neeson kind of game the system in this Ocean's Eleven plan to get attention on him, you're on the edge of your seat. It has like all the elements of Spielberg. And I think that's why this movie hits so hard because when you get into the stuff, the harder stuff, the brutality, and the reality of the Holocaust, it it hits you much harder. I think he's really good at making you feel, feel. Yeah, those early scenes, like when we're introduced to Schindler, are really fascinating. I mean, the way we first see Schindler, like we've had this opening scene of kind of chaos of people showing up in Krakow, outside disorder, people trying to register the horrible like upheaval that the Jewish people in Poland that their lives are going through. And then he cuts to basically like a cologne ad. 
Yeah. And you're inside Schindler's house. You're not even seeing his face. You're watching his hands as he's like, look at my lovely rich things. Look at the money I'm touching. Look at my watches. And the light sort of like wrapping around him. I mean, it looks like he's about to turn to the camera and be like, you know, brute, the essence of a man. Yeah. And then you even have this like almost good in tracking shot, you know, where he like enters the club and you're still yeah. not even looking at his face. It's like the buildup of just wait till you see Liam Neeson. And Liam Neeson's not a star yet, but they're like, just wait till you see Liam Neeson. And that Scorsese camera work, I think, kind of cracks me up because it's there's this unseen Schindler's List, which is the Schindler's List directed by Martin Scorsese, which yeah. could have existed, which Scorsese was supposed to make it. I know. I found this to be fascinating that... Basically, Spielberg didn't want to direct Schindler's List until he felt – he didn't feel emotionally ready to do it. So he tried to get Roman Polanski to do it. And Roman Polanski, you know, felt too connected to it. He went off to make The Pianist much later. And then I think at one point got it off to Martin Scorsese and then had to kind of barter back for it. Like when he was directing Hook, he's like, no, I can make Schindler's List now. Had to go back and they switched. Scorsese got Cape Fear and uh, Spielberg got – uh, Schindler's List fan. Yeah, and I can't help thinking that that camera angle through the club is sort of him being like, all right, this this is my homage to the man who probably would have done that part <laughs> this exact same way. I don't think Scorsese would have done anything else in this film exactly the same. Maybe well, the blood pumping out of the heads. The way Spielberg directed this movie was very different than the way that he directed films previously. He did not storyboard this film at all. He uh, decided to not plan the film with storyboards and to shoot it like it was a documentary. 40% of the film was shot with handheld cameras and they shot it very quickly over these 72 days. Um, he felt that it would give the film uh, more of an edge and he'd kind of serve the subject to get in closer with people. He didn't use steady cams, elevated shots, or zoom lenses, things that were kind of the safety net of Spielberg in many respects. So it's interesting to think that he challenged himself as a director here to do something totally uh, different, which is why, talking to your point about the clone ad, I think it's interesting this movie is in black and white. And, and I was trying to wrap my head around it. And at first I was like, oh, I think it's interesting to talk about the Holocaust and you put a black and white filter on it it gives you that kind of emotional distance. We were talking about that before with Clockwork Orange, like what kind of allows you to watch something awful but also makes it somewhat comforting? Oh, that's so interesting because that's two totally different approaches. Super saturated, dramatic color yeah. that does not exist in real life. And then unless you're like in one of those Instagram pop-up museums. <laughs> and, and then also the exact opposite, making it black and white in the way that you never see life. And then I was also thinking, oh, well, we've only seen – the Holocaust or footage of the Holocaust when it was going on in black and white footage. And in a weird way, seeing it in black and white makes it feel more real because the way that our mind, or at least my mind works in the, in the, in the pictures that I've seen, it feels like, Oh, this is a historical document. I know it's a movie, but there is something that kind of makes those, you know, like the whole crystal knock sequence where everyone's being like pulled out of their houses. It feels like you're watching a newsreel footage. I mean, isn't that interesting? It's like only in the last 200 years of human existence would we be able to say that the black and white image is how we think of the past being. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? No, absolutely. That he's like, I always think of the past in black and white, you know, because right. the or at least the chunk of the past that we see. Like I think of Ben-Hur happening in color and then right. I think of anything from the Civil War – to like 1950 happening in black and white. But it's because our history books, it's because when you go to a museum and you see, you know, these documents of our past. Okay, so you know, while we're talking about this, last week we asked our listeners to call in and tell us their thoughts on black and white movies, especially since they're having kind of minor resurgence, not just with Roma, not just with Schindler's List back in theaters. There's also the film Cold War that just came out. It's the Poland Oscar nominee. Oh my God, it's incredible. All right, so let's take a listen to what y'all think. I enjoy a black and white film, whether it's natively black and white from back in the 30s or 40s, or whether it's black and white shot now, because it's something that forces me to stop and pay attention to it. And it's also a dramatic thing. It's like a comic book aspect to it. It doesn't really make sense as a concept to go back and do something that was there for budgetary reasons or an invention not being there. It would be like if a director was saying, I'm not going to have any electric lights on my set. I'm only going to have candles. Modern black and white films such as Francis Ha or Coffee and Cigarettes 
easily help us focus on the core of a film's dialogue and meaning. The thing about black and white for me is I feel like almost similar to watching a movie with subtitles, I feel like I have to be in the right mindset for it. I don't know why that's the case. I'm kind of embarrassed of that fact. I feel like I should be smarter or I know better. Um, you know, I can remember distinctly being a kid and, and seeing, uh, you know, the cover art and like a trailer for Clerks and thinking, I'm not going to watch this. It's black and white. You know, is there a colorized version? But once I actually sat down to watch the movie, it uh, it ended up being a great entry point for me for, you know, additional black and white films. And it kind of removed the, the oldness because it was this new, young, funny, cool film at the time. Look, this movie is a gut wrenching movie that I think is so beautifully shot, and I know it's three hours and 15 minutes, I probably could have watched more of it, even though it's tough to watch, because it really, I think you feel so engulfed in this world, even though it's it's not something that you would willingly want to jump in. It's not like a movie that you're just like, let's pop it in, you know? Which is interesting, because it's similar, I think, in a lot of ways to the tone of a Shawshank. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of doing the same redemptive, massage work right on what makes a man's soul worthy mm-hmm. but one of them is the most popped in casual movie of all time and then one of them is is not also yeah. kind of to your point before we like move on from it there are some shots in here that i feel like i almost just have seen completely in in old newsreel footage like when you yes. have the shots of mass graves when you see the shots of piles of shoes it dings this bell in the back of your head because you're like oh i did absolutely see that yeah. In a history book. Well, when there I, – I feel like a lot of the crowd scenes are the scenes that uh, – you've seen people go down these roadways. You're like, oh, this this feels I, – I, I'm going to sound stupid a couple times in this podcast, but it feels real. It just feels like you're there. Although, honestly, I mean, one statistic that I read that I blinked at because it seems impossible, but maybe I just live an incredibly cloistered existence or maybe I just live like – mostly a post Schindler's List existence is that Steven Spielberg was saying that part of what drove him to make the movie then is that when they did surveys, apparently 40% of Americans didn't really know that the Holocaust had happened, which I find kind of insane. I don't really understand how that's possible, Yeah, but that 40% of Americans didn't really realize either the extent of it or where it had happened or or the facts, and he made this as an establishment of we cannot forget. And now it seems insane to me that we can forget, but I guess in a way it doesn't seem insane because like it's happening again and like I don't even know. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you say that, and I think this film, you know, the reason why it was re-released is it's an anniversary year for the film, but Spielberg was recently actually talking about why he thinks this film is important to be released right now. So take a listen to this. Individual hate is a terrible thing. But when collective hate organizes and gets industrialized, then genocide follows. And we have to take it more seriously today than I think we have had to take it in in a generation. And now we're in an era that, you know, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Xenophobia. We we, we, we all know what what happened happened in Pittsburgh. Is this an important time to re-release this film? I think this is maybe the most important time to re-release this film. Possibly now is even a more important time to re-release Schindler's List than 1993, 94, when it was initially released. Yeah, I mean, like, what was going on in 93, 94 that made him want to do this then besides feeling like he was more emotionally mature than when he bought it, which was around the time of E.T. Yeah. I think he had just finished E.T. Is also, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall had him really spooked that we are going to start forgetting all of this so that anti-Semitism was going to be on the rise again in Eastern Europe. And it kind of was to the point that, like, when you have, like, Ray Fiennes stomping through as Gert, there were stories of, like old women in Poland coming up to him, like thinking mistakenly that he was a real Nazi, that the Nazis had come back and saying like, oh, thank you for everything you did. Can you get the rest of them this time? Wow. I mean, it's so disturbing. And I think these incidents, because there were a few anti-Semitic incidents on set, made Spielberg come up with this ending, which he didn't really know until the middle of production, which was having all the uh, Schindler Jews place rocks on his grave because it shows, no, the, this is real. These are people that were there, you know? And and there is something about that ending because it brings into focus that, yes, you've just watched this movie and no matter what, it's not a historical document. It is, you know, a dramatization of a historical time. And by putting 
real faces there. It shows like, no, no, this is, you know, we really need to respect what went on here. And I mean, not that you don't, but I think that like you're saying in 1983, if you're saying that people didn't even know the Holocaust happened, that's a pretty, you know, shocking thing. Yeah, it seems mental, but I was reading this really great piece by my old editor when I was at the LA Weekly, Alan Shearstall. Mm. He was talking about how when he went to school in, in Kansas, when his history teacher taught World War II, his history teacher just skipped over the Holocaust part. And Alan, as a kid, raised his hand. And he's like, aren't we going to talk about that? And his teacher's like, oh, it's really not that important. This is American history, and we don't care about that. And he was wow. he was trying to explain this piece. Like, in a way, it wasn't that his teacher would have ever thought he was anti-Semitic. Right. And maybe in a way, it wasn't even. He just was dehumanizing, which I guess is the same thing in a way. He just didn't think anything mattered. Well, I think this is why film is important, because it humanizes events you know at least in the holocaust films that i've seen it's often one person's perspective their life and we are feeling the weight of it around them where this film kind of covers many parts of the final solution through various people's eyes and i think by getting out of one character and moving over to another character and seeing it through the worker through schindler through the accountant through Gert, like we, and then sometimes just people that we never even really revisit or just people we revisit for seconds to see, you know, these bigger moments, it really allows you to kind of take in what went on there on an emotional level. I, I, I think, you know, one of the scenes that got me the most into small scene is when they kind of are separating all the women for like a health check. And while they're doing that, they're taking the children away. And, you know, and, the, and when the mothers realize that their children are being taken away and they're so happily being taken away, like, you know, you're getting to see so many different perspectives. It doesn't feel uh, like it's playing on your heartstrings in a way. It just plays like it's, I felt like everything was being presented to you as like this happened. It's not presented as melodrama. And I think there's something about it that really pulls you, you know, in, you feel like when you've left that you've also learned something. Well, yeah, it's like there's something in the way that he films it, you know, that scene, other scenes where, you know, having that like handheld immediacy, it's like, here we are, you know, decades later, knowing the stages of what happened and knowing, knowing what's going to happen, knowing how bad right. it's going to get. But by filming it where you're the camera's sort of over here looking at this and there's a thing happening in the background that nobody in this part of the scene is paying attention to and to sort of run over there and be like, wait, hold on. There's like a chaotic surprise almost to the right. way the camera moves around. You know, you see that so much in the scene where they try to basically like exterminate the Krakow ghetto. And, it, you know, that was a scene I think was like only one page long in the script and he shot 20 minutes of it. You know, he shot right. the equivalent of 20 pages of it where it's just absolute mayhem you know like the camera almost feels like it's trying to catch a glimpse of what's happening over here as families are getting ripped apart faces get really close to the camera so you see the face like you're confronted with the face but then you don't know what's happening people are yelling in german and he doesn't subtitle that he just lets it be chaos yeah well i think the whole movie there's no german translations you never hear it and i know he originally wanted to do the whole film uh in you know german and polish but I think rightfully so he realized that reading subtitles would take you out of the film. And I, I think he does a great job of by not translating the German, you feel like you're an outsider to what's going on there. Like the thing that I think Spielberg and Kaminsky did is uh, is you see these close ups on them on people's faces and they don't really look like movie close ups because they have like all this texture on them. Like you see mm -hmm. pores, you see like wrinkles you see like human flesh well i think you know it's worth noting that in 1993 when you're watching this movie there aren't really any recognizable faces i think the most recognizable face is ben kingsley um but at this point you know liam neeson and uh and ray fines are not household names at all you know and this is in the beginning i think spielberg was like oh who should we get and i you know mel gibson was one of the people that they were talking to at a certain Can point we talk about that yeah because, like, please if this film was exactly the way the film is mm -hmm. exactly this good in all of the in yeah. all of its aspects but starring mel gibson as oscar schindler would it be forever ruined with what mel gibson did i right? think you could never really watch it no you could never watch this movie knowing that i mean look the choices that they kind of played with. I mean, Warren Beatty 
came so close that he was doing table reads as Oscar Schindler. I think the smartest thing you can do a lot of times in films like this is take away the stars because you need to kind of not be watching a celebrity. You need to be just kind of getting the story. Yeah, but what you have with like Neeson though, that you would definitely not have with Gibson, but like Neeson is six foot four. He's a gigantic man, Mm -hmm. you know? And when he walks into scenes, he's taller than everybody. And he's in these gigantic suits and they're like white silk when everybody else is not. And he just stands out as this like kind of Gatsby figure. Like he cuts a Gatsby figure the way that he walks, the way that he's tall. Sometimes I feel a little weird about how he's always like looming over people. Yeah. And looking gigantic. Like I think the one time he doesn't get to look gigantic is when his wife shows up. And is like, hello, I'm here at your house. Who's that girl? And then there's like this one camera angle where it's like behind her and he finally looks small. But usually he walks in as this gigantic, I hate to say the word white knight because it's like loaded, but it's the way he looks. It's the way he's moving. But don't you agree that Ray Fiennes almost looks identical to him in a weird way? Like when they cut back and forth between the two shaving scenes, they're both getting ready for the morning. There is a similarity to what they look like. They're both tall i mean ray fines gained a lot of weight here i think uh just drank guinness to kind of get that beer belly going that upsets me because guinness is what i drink when i'm trying to drink beer and not gain weight oh amy guinness that's like it's like drinking a stew yeah but in a good way guinness has like calories it has nutrition oh calories are not necessarily good yeah but it has like vitamins and and it it actually has fewer calories than most other beers drink a bud light you'll be fine guinness has like the same amount of calories as a bud light no it it actually has nutrition all right maybe or you know what We'll, we'll have somebody look this up All first. Right, but please look that up. Um, but, but I think that there's a similarity between these two people. That's what I thought was so interesting. Like, he cast them in a way that they could be parallel. Like, they're both on different tracks. And they're both these stories of, like, one person making choices. And I think that that's what this whole movie is. Like, I mean, and I think it's been said before. I'm not saying it. that This is my idea. But one person can make a difference. Hold up, hold up. I hate to break off your fascinating thought, but I have just okay. been informed yes. that a 12-ounce serving of Guinness is 125 calories, which is only 15 calories more than a, that same serving size of Bud Light. Whoa, I did not know that. And by the way, thank you for listening to our Schindler's List podcast where we get into some heavy <laughs> beer specifics. You didn't think you were going to get it, but you're getting it. Um, no, I think I just thought it was interesting that they they just look kind of so similar yeah i mean i feel like this film is built on kind of like this mirrored symmetry Mm -hmm. and i mean that scene makes it extra obvious there's a bunch of other scenes too that i want to talk about like later but that scene in particular it's like here are two men who look alike Mm -hmm. here are two men who could be alike they're both running factories of some kind you know like there's there's a labor you know they're both well connected they both wear the same Pin, you know, in yeah. essence, I mean, fa- finds is is fancier because he's like a higher promotion. Right. But they don't have to act the same way. Well, but I was saying that there are two men who want respect and they're getting it through different ways. Like Schindler is trying to pretend to be this rich man to get this business and kind of help put himself. And I think then you have Ray Fine's character who is trying to get respect through ultimate fear. And, you know, so you would never question him. Well, there must be some sort of connection there in the way that the film really drills into how much Ray Fiennes starts to hero worship Liam Neeson. Yeah. Because he really does. Like, he really starts to admire hanging out with him. Because, like, you have all these shots of just, like, Liam Neeson being a cool dude with, like, a tuxedo leaning by his car, being like, hello, my friend, let me give you some advice. I mean, there's that really interesting scene where Ray Fiennes gets drunk tells Oscar Schindler he notices he never gets drunk, that he admires his control. And Liam Neeson uses that moment to give this speech to try to subtly push him towards killing fewer people. That's what the emperor said. A man stole something, he's brought in before the emperor, he throws himself down on the ground, he begs for mercy. He knows he's going to die. And the emperor pardons him. He's a worthless man. He lets him go. I think you are drunk. That's power, Amon. That is power. What I 
think is so fascinating about that scene is it's a way of confronting evil from the side. Do you know what I mean? He's never like, stop killing people. You know, he's because it's the moral thing to do. He never makes a moral argument. He makes arguments about why it would be better for him casually. He uses friendship to manipulate him instead of aggression, which which is interesting. Like you're saying Ruth Bader Ginsburg gets elected to the Supreme Court. And that has been her strategy so much of the time, you know, was like befriending Anton Scalia, nudging him in little directions. People get mad at her for being friends with Anton Scalia. And she'd be like, well, you can kind of work more power by befriending contemptible people, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around, but this is such an illustration of the nudges you can do. Well, yeah, and I think he's playing to what is at his core. I I, I think that Gert is someone who is a a brute, right? You know, we see it from that opening introduction of him. And this is going back to what I was talking about with Spielberg. And I'm reticent to say it out loud, so please bear with me on this. But there are still things in this movie that are very cool cinematically that you can enjoy as, wow, like the introduction of our villain is, if this was not about the Holocaust, if this was in a regular film, you're like, whoa, this is this is one of the best villains of all time. Yes, it's based on a true person. Yes, this is things that actually happen. But like when we're introduced to him, the way he comes in, you know, first kind of looking these women up and down and, and picking the woman who's most afraid of him to be his housekeeper. And then when the female architect comes over and says, you know, this is built on the wrong foundation, we need to fix it. He orders her execution right in front of everyone and then does what she recommended anyway. It's like, from a filmmaking perspective, like what a great introduction to a villain. Yes, this is a real person and there are real lives at stake. But I also feel like one of the things that he does here is really uh, get you to kind of be on this journey with him too. You see this guy who wants this power so much. And so when Schindler kind of appeals to him and goes, no, no, the real power is, is this. It's the only thing that kind of, that the only way you could ever get to him is by kind of going to his core because he everything he does is like i'll smash it and then i'll be better than it yeah there are these ways where exactly he is sort of like a movie villain like wait let's play his actual first line okay this is when he's being driven into the camp we've just seen his name flash up on screen um and people who know the story of the holocaust would know that he was one of the most merciless butchers ever ever of of, in a lot of competition yes i mean he was about the worst. And yet what we're seeing of him is he's like a slender shouldered man in the back of this car with a handkerchief on his nose, which is one of those details I love because you it makes you think about what it must smell like there. Yeah. And it makes him look sort of cartoonish. And he's getting this tour, he's learning about the camp, and this is his reaction. Surplus labor. The elderly and infirm mostly. Which is where you will want to start, huh? Do you have any questions, sir? Yeah, well, it's top down. I'm fucking freezing. That scene makes me say a thing that I think is a little bit hard, but I think is true, and I think I need to say it, which is that Schindler's List, I think Steven Spielberg is actually really funny. Well, I think I, this movie is kind of meant to be very funny when it is meant to be funny. Well, I was going to talk about that because I felt that, too, there are th- things here that are still very cinematic. They're moving, they're ex- you know exciting, and they are funny, And it's interesting because when you think about Schindler's List, you don't think about humor. But the scene when they're trying to execute that guy and no one's gun works, that's a funny scene. I mean, that is something that you would see in Indiana Jones. I mean, there are scenes that are straight out of Indiana Jones. There's a scene in that horrible like decimation of the ghetto when they shoot three prisoners with one bullet. That happens in an Indiana Jones movie. And I think maybe what that is is you can change the topic that the filmmaker is making, but you're always going to have the stamps of that filmmaker. Martin Scorsese would have directed this very differently. I I think the way he shows violence, while brutal, and yes, we're talking about blood pumping out of the face, you see a lot of it on other people's faces, like blood splattering on other people's faces. And blood splattering. The reactions. Yeah, reactions. His reactions. He loves reactions. He's not going for, and not to bring up Mel Gibson again, but like the Passion of the Christ version of this, where you're seeing brutality to such a way, or what was that movie, uh, Son of Saul, where, you know, it's it's almost uncomfortable to watch. This movie, I think, makes many attempts to get you in 
so you're not like, I, I can't watch this. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Well, it's like, I think the blessing and the vulnerability in equal measure of Schindler's List is that Steven Spielberg can't help but want to entertain. Right. And but that's okay, does. right? I mean, it should be okay, but it is also kind of complicated. Like, well, yeah, like I feel bad sort of laughing and squirming and feeling that movie thriller moment when the gun doesn't work. Yeah. Or the one where the women are mistakenly shipped to Auschwitz and they think they're going to be gassed in the showers and it takes forever. You're watching them right. run around and huddle and be sad and be naked and be crying. And then it's just water coming out. It's yeah. just an actual shower. I feel like 800 different ways about that scene. Right. Part of me is like, I feel bad for those actresses having to run around and be naked and be huddled and the camera being like, check it out. But right. then also that did happen to real women. So it's good to watch it. But then also like, I'm glad that they didn't die. You know, I right. believe they don't die, but also I'm mad that Spielberg put me in that position and then found a way kind of as a director to be a hero and save it to save the women. Like he kind of saves them in this, directorly way and right. and i am i'm churned up about that scene but you need these moments because then when you're watching these moments of absolute brutality whether it's something very personal like ray finds beating up the woman who's playing his maid you know and 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 that sequence or a child trying to hide in the latrines you know or when you see this lone image of this girl in in red you know it's it, like those are the moments that you need relief really from. You can't have a movie just stacked and stacked and stacked with these awful moments. You know, yes, what we're watching is awful 100%, but you need to still create a film that's, that is just not going to be just complete agony, you know? Yeah, I mean, can I play like a clip that yeah. is not a major dramatic point, but to me, I, can, I think kind of sums up everything that Spielberg is doing craft-wise in this. Yeah. This is pretty early on in the film, by which I mean it's like 20 minutes into the film, mm -hmm. where um, we've seen some wealthy Jewish people be kicked out of their lovely home and Schindler move into it. And um, as he's moving in and getting settled, they're being relocated into the ghetto. And um, he's using like parallel kind of cross-cutting of people like moving into their new quarters, also parallel dialogue to make sure we get yes. it. And then also trying to make it a comedy beat. Like it's almost like a bump bum ch Here, let me play it. <laughs> let me play it. It could not be better. It could be worse. Oh, tell me. How on earth could it possibly be worse? Dien dobre. Dien dobre. Dien dobre. And it is worse because yeah. that sound was like a half dozen people now moving in also to their room. I think there's something interesting about life imitating art here. You know, one of the famous stories about this film is that Spielberg was incredibly depressed um, by directing this film. You know, it, it's a lot, I think it's a lot on his shoulders. You know, he won't autograph anything related to it, not taking any payment from it. You know, he really wants to he respect calls it blood it, money. Calls it blood money. But because he's dealing with such weighty subject matter, you know, one of the stories is like, oh, Robin Williams would call him up and, and entertain him, do these uh, like comedy monologues for him, uh, you know, little stand up routines, and then just to keep him in a good mood. And I feel like that kind of infused itself into the film, I'm sure, while editing this. You're like, well, we need a moment, we need this, you know. And there's a little other thing that I just found in researching this. There was something else that brought him some joy, and that was Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song. Uh, did the that's Hanukkah the big... song, and then like, Spielberg called. You get a call from from Spielberg. Spielberg. That was that was great. He's the top guy. It was a great. What does one. he call? Like like I he just says, hey, some, I was watching you. And somebody gave him my number and he left a nice message and he was shooting Schindler's List and he. You would have been perfect for that. <laughs> <laughs> he left a message saying that he that making the movie was very depressing and during the shoot it was very difficult for and he said somebody brought that song up they had a tape of it oh and that they watched that and it would help them laugh and do you start thinking in your mind holy shit this is it <laughs> i mean i'm gonna be in the next field but like right sure, you think sure and nothing, was, nothing happens right nothing, that's also that, another mind happen. fuck uh, I just thought that was so interesting to think of Spielberg on set of Schindler's List watching like Adam Sandler <laughs> on Saturday Night Live. But I think, you know, I think it's any port in a storm to kind of help you get through this material. Also, by the way, weirdo fun fact about yeah. the Robin Williams thing. Yeah. You know, Liam Neeson almost had his American breakout a couple of years before this. Uh -huh. um, he was going to be the star of Dead Poet Society. Oh, wow. And then that director quit and got replaced. And when that director got replaced, he was like, bye, Liam. And he hired Robin Williams. I mean, well, to the point 
of his switch, right? Of his switch over. You know, I think structurally, I very much buy the switch mm -hmm. until probably the last half hour. Um, Interesting. Why? Why the last half hour? There's something in the last half hour where he suddenly like starts to know more about Jewish culture without really seeming to. His... Are you talking about like that moment where he goes up to one of the the foremen on the floor and is like, "You should be getting ready for you know services," you know, like that moment? Yeah, it starts to suddenly become like a Scrooge movie. Like he very suddenly gets nice. I think it's also because right next to that scene is when he like goes to his wife and he's like. Let's get back together. There's something in putting those two scenes back to back that, like, but they don't you flag think it's about as unrealistic for me, or maybe not unrealistic, but because I know that this actually happened, but unsupported. Well, here's how I viewed it, and this is you know my perspective on it. He's a man who, when he puts his mind to something, knows how to manipulate a situation. He will find out who's going to be sitting at that table. He'll call over the right people. He basically did all of his, you know, pot and pan making was done in that one kind of night. You know, he knew to get the pictures and to play on all these people, get the right sardines, get the right fruit. Once he makes that turn, like the other thing, now his perspective has shifted. And now his perspective is, I'm all in on this. It wasn't just like, oh, yeah, and I'll do this. It was like, no, I'm doing this down to my last penny. And it's interesting that, you know, after World War II, he is a man who can't launch anything else. He, you know, kind of is a failure after this. Like every business he tried to launch kind of falls apart. And and one wonders, like, if after you have the ultimate focus, you know, this this thing, the most important thing, how could you ever devote any time to anything? Because it's, it's so less substantial than the thing that you did. It, his wife basically flat out said those years during the war were the only times of his year he was, like, worth anything, honestly, wow. as a person. I think his wife also gets to be a little bit bitter. Uh, I think his wife kind of gets short shrift here. It's hard to be like, in a three-hour and 15-minute movie, yeah. you should have had more of the wife. you know. But I think the wife actually may have been more responsible for his shift than she gets credit for here. Oh, you know, Because like, stories I've heard about his wife, you know, she sort of wrote her own counter book. She was best friends when she was growing up with a girl who was Jewish and she was told not to be and she just defied them and was friends with her friend anyway and then her friend eventually was murdered. There's a big story that's not in the film where he said yes to receiving like the shipment of Jewish um, inmates who had been deemed not worthy of working and they put them in this freezing cold train car, sent them over to Schindler and by the time they arrived they were f almost entirely frozen to death and they were never able to work and she basically became the nurse of them, like the hospital maid, yeah. and took care of all of them. She was really there the whole time doing a lot of this. And he gets a lot of the credit because, you know, kind of in the well, way we frame history, like yeah. one of the things I read is somebody wrote about him pretty recently um, to when it happened. Like they wrote about this in like the 50s. They wrote like, oh, and when, it, when he was running out of money, he sold his wife's jewelry, which makes it sound like he just sort of took her jewelry and sold it. Right. And not like she sold her own jewelry or she made the own choice to sell it. Like he gets a lot of credit for the things that she was also there doing. And then maybe also there's just a little bit of me that's like sticking up for her because, you know, as the movie says, like they moved to Argentina at the end, um, they wind up over there. And then when all of his businesses in Argentina fail, he just ditches her. Like the movie says like he failed at marriage, but really what he did is he just like left her in Argentina and never came back. And she never saw him again for like 17 years or really ever because then he died. No. And you know what? I really hear that. And I wonder if part of it is the way the story is passed down, like this oral tradition, right? The idea that like Thomas Keneally finds out about Schindler. This is the guy who wrote the book that Schindler's List is based on. Schindler's Ark is the name of the book. He finds out about this because he's at like a leather goods store on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills in 1980. And the owner of the store is like, let me tell you the greatest story that humanity knows. You know, this man, he saved everyone. And he, and he kind of tells the story of Schindler's List to Thomas Keneally. Yeah, I mean, Poldek, the guy who told the author about this story, he really is to me one of the unsung heroes of this because he resolved right after they escaped from the war that he was going to figure out how to make people know about Schindler. And he moves to Hollywood. He gets this luggage store. He basically, from like the 50s on, 
is telling every single person with entertainment connections who comes into his store in Beverly Hills, make a movie about this guy. You're a writer, make a movie about this guy. Nobody really ever took him up on it. He kept hammering and hammering. Sometimes people would start, they'd nibble, they'd go this far. It never worked out. When finally this book, Schindler's Art, comes out, he gets Steven Spielberg's number because he sort of knows his mother somehow. Mother's wow. no mother, something like that. He calls him literally every month for 11 years and says like, when are you going to stop messing with these furry beasts? And like tries to convince him to do this film. I mean, he's really the guy. You see him, by the way, if you want to know his parallel, he's the guy in the church when Schindler comes in and he's like, I like your shirt. Oh. That's his uh, counterpart. Oh, that's wow. Who, that's who he is. And he's really the guy. Like his quote about it was, you know, Schindler gave me my life and I tried to give him immortality. And I think Thomas Kinley puts it together, but it's it's a, a warp side of history. It's Schindler's list. You know, so it's like it's the idea that it's him. You know, even the character in the in the film, which is played by Ben Kingsley, is an amalgam of many different characters, you know, but he's the one that's, you know, singularly responsible. And I and I wonder if in writing a novel where you're basing it off of things that you're looking at and you're and you're seeing, you can kind of make the man better. Because, of course, he's amazing. Like, of course, what he did was amazing. And you, everyone else is, who cares about everybody else? It's just about this one person. It's an easier story to tell, to be like, this one person was responsible. And to be fair, what I'm talking about is sort of what the film is about, even if it isn't about anything I'm just talking about. Uh, because it's about, you know, what makes a person good. Or, like, can a person be complicated good? Mm -hmm. You know, can Oscar Schindler be complicated good? Good. I mean, Oscar Schindler, his nickname before he even showed up in the camp in real life was, I think, like Swindler or something. That mm. was what people would call Oscar him. Oscar Swindler? Yeah. By all means, he actually really was never that good of a dude up until right. this one moment. Like, he got expelled from school for, like, forging his report card. Like, he was allegedly, I, th I think actually both of them were Nazi spies in the way where they were, like, Telling the Nazis how the trains worked in Poland, helping them like learn information before the invasion, you know. But it and goes back to this idea that there's never too late to change. I mean, as I know it's a very Christmassy kind of idea. Like, if you decide, like in this moment, you know, once bad doesn't mean always bad. And I think we probably are more closer to Schindler than we are to Mother Teresa. Right? Like, I mean, in the grand scheme of, like, life. Like, you don't you know. want to get me started on Mother Teresa. I have some very <laughs> no, I know. popular I opinions on Mother Teresa. Probably the wrong person to pick. But you know what I'm saying? Like, we're not all one thing or the other. We, I think we're an amalgam. And, and someone who could be very kind of shady and, and played both sides could also use that ability to play both sides to help people, too, you know? Yeah, and I will say that I like that message. I believe in that message very strongly. Like, yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm asterisk being like, hot take, you're canceled for the thing that you did. Hot take, Schindler was bad. Amy yeah, Nicholson. Exactly. Because I do think that all human beings are more complicated, which is probably one of my favorite things about this film, is that it gets into that. Because it's just a very core belief I have. Yeah. You know, that everybody has tons of bad in them as well and if we deny it well uh we're we all a little bit alex from clockwork orange aren't we that's I exactly we what are. um here's something interesting this is uh, liam neeson uh back when the film was released talking about his character and he kind of talks exactly about what we're talking about i think it's interesting that his vices as well as his virtues save lives uh, we all like to think of a hero as someone and whiter than white you know he was a human being like everyone else filled with contradictions and it was the, con the interplay of the contradictions that actually saved him and these hundreds of lives. Yeah, and I did, you know, I mean, it's, he's saying exactly what we're saying too. It's just like, you know, sometimes it takes a thief to catch a thief, you know? Yeah, I mean, a morally superior person could maybe not have accomplished this because he wouldn't know how to bribe or steal or lie or yeah. work the system. Apparently one of the stories is that Steven Spielberg had hired a writer who spent four years trying to come up with a way that the script could capture his redemption and couldn't do it and gave up. Oh, wow. And so then he gave the script to somebody else, to Steven Zalen. And what he did is he decided to actually use an influence from da -da 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 -da, Citizen Kane. Oh, wow. Yeah, he thought of Rosebud and how Rosebud symbolizes something almost unexplainable to, to Kane himself. And he tried, he used that idea and he funneled it into the image of the girl in the red coat. Like this thing that catches his eye that he can never quite articulate that means so much in the center of his heart 
that is the reason why he starts to turn over, but without being able to put it into words. And to, to him, that's what the girl in the red coat was. Literally a line drawing straight from Citizen Kane to that coat. To the fact that I actually now, uh, Steven Spielberg owns the sled. You know, it's interesting. I read an idea like what that red coat means. It's like, it, you know, it's a perfect symbol for that Mother Teresa quote. If I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at one, I will. And and it's almost like by seeing that red coat, it it, it shows him one singular idea. That's really, I, that's really beautiful. Yeah, there's all this chaos and you focus on that. It, apparently the girl who shot it, she was like three years old at yeah. the time. You know, she was told by Spielberg, do not watch this movie. And until she was 18. Yeah. And she watched it when she was 11. Yeah. And she realized she made a mistake. Hey, ladies out there, look at your legs. Are you wearing jeans? I'm betting a lot of you are probably wearing jeans. I'm wearing jeans. And if you're not wearing jeans, maybe you're thinking, hey, this day would be a lot more comfortable if I was wearing jeans. So if that's on your mind, let me talk to you about the My Fit Jeans. My Fit Jeans are these amazing, insane, incredible types of jeans that fit everybody. All you have to do is check like one size or this other size and they are guaranteed to fit you. It's crazy. My jeans are made from this fabric called Flex Tech Denim. It's super soft and it also sort of conforms to your body however you need it to go so that it doesn't bag or sag in all the places that your particular body it's interesting that it curves in fascinating directions. They are literally designed for all women because they come in one of two sizes that will fit all women. You can either pick stunning, which fits regular sizes 2 to 12, or you can pick gorgeous, which fits sizes 14 to 20. And whatever size you pick, it is available in three different washes. You got your dark wash, you got your light wash, and you got your black. That sounds amazing. But if you want some proof that it's amazing, go to myfitjeans.com or check out their hashtag on Instagram or Facebook, and you can see real women, ordinary women, try on the jeans and see how they fit and then be like, okay, I think I do want to try that out myself. So if you do, you can. Risk-free, 60 days. And if you're not fully satisfied with those jeans, you can return them for a full refund. So here's how you do it. If you go to myfitjeans.com right now and you enter the code UNSPOOLED, you can get one pair for 15% off. Awesome. Or if you buy two, the second pair will be 50% off. That means you can go like mix and match. You can be like, oh, I want a light wash and I want a black. That's how I'm feeling right now. Or you can be like, yo, I want two dark wash because I know what I like. So go to MyFitJeans right now, put in the promo code UNSPOOLED and get your jeans on. Have an awesome comfy day. So I'm guessing a lot of people listening to this show also listen to another one of our super popular shows. Hello from the Magic Tavern. It is a fully improvised comedy show set in a magical world. You've got wizards talking to badgers, talking to just like this dude from Chicago who fell through a dimensional portal. It is absolute madness. It's been on forever. It's got the best guests. You've got Paul F. Tompkins. You've got Lauren Lapkus. You've got Felicia Day. You've got Sean and Hayes, the Hollywood handbook dudes. But now they're doing something special because a little magical book I would say a canon-worthy book, the type of book that would be on a major list, has fallen through this portal. And so this band is now all together reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice while in this insane tavern that's basically like Cheers of Middle Earth. I mean, have you ever wanted to hear a wizard figure out if he's like more Lizzie or more like Mr. Darcy? Because you can. And my God, I mean, the beard would sort of work with both, I guess. I think Lizzie could rock a beard if she didn't want people to annoy her. So what's awesome about Hello from the Magic Tavern is this is actually the kind of podcast where you can like plunge in and just like hear this episode and not feel like you're missing out on too much because it's just absolute chaos from start to finish. So plunge in with this one. Do Hello from the Magic Tavern. Check out Pride and Prejudice because I guess a lot of you out there are like literate types who know it or at least you've seen the movies that like do it in like modern day settings. But now it's like being done in this insane world with like tons of wine goblets. So check out Hello from the Magic Tavern right now on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. Let's talk about Ben Kingsley's character, uh, the the accountant Stern. And this is like one of these really subtle Ben Kingsley characters. I feel like Ben Kingsley has gotten bigger as the time has gone on kind of, and I think here he's playing something so kind of subtle and, and kind of masterful. I, I really love the way he, he plays this character. Yeah. I heard that when he did this character the whole time, he had Anne Frank's picture in his pocket. Oh really? I heard it say it's something else in his pocket. What, what did you hear? Well, I heard that he had come up to Spielberg and he said, I wrote something down in my pocket about what I think uh, the narrative function of my role is. And I want you to write it down and let's compare our our things. And so Spielberg wrote down witness and Kingsley wrote down 
conscious. And they kind of agreed that the character would be this combination of a witness and the conscience of the film. And these are the two pieces of paper that he carried with him on set to always remind himself that that was what he was supposed to be. Yeah, I mean, that scene where he tells Liam Neeson when he temporarily is like shifted away to work for refines, like, don't screw up my factory. Yeah. I've worked really hard on it. Like the pride he has in that moment, I really enjoy. It, it is a little weird that like the last major scene when they drive away is him basically reassuring Liam Neeson that he's a good guy, you know? Right. Where it's like the the moral energy of who gets soothed is very much shifted from the people who have just survived like five years of constant risk of death to the one guy who's only been in peril for like a day. Right, but I, I do think that if we're thinking about this character less as a human being, yes, Stern existed, 100%. But what he's doing there, I think, talks to what you're saying. Like, it by having him there, it, it takes some pressure off of Schindler to be this white knight, you know, because here's a man who's like, no, you're doing it wrong, you're doing this wrong. And I think in that moment, it's the inward voice outwardly embracing him, you know, because he's like, I could have saved more. I could, you know, this ring, this car, the, and he's seeing what he could have done maybe too late or, or again, there, how many would be enough? None would be enough until none were killed. You know, I think, so I think what Kingsley does in that, in that moment there is to kind of have to be his conscience to be like, no, no, you did, you did the best that you could. I don't yeah. know. That scene really struck me. I mean, I mean that scene is such an example of like the symmetry that's in this film. You know, it's Schindler looking at objects and saying what they're worth in human lives. Mm. Bracketed by at the very beginning, he's like saying to the investors, money does not matter anymore. Now it's all objects, you know? Yeah. Like this is a movie that opens with people touching money, has many fetishy scenes of suitcases of money. And yet like... There's one type of worth that he establishes at the beginning, which is pots and pans and keeping people fed. And then the other type at the end, which is like what he could have done with those pots and pans and the, and what he could have like refunded with it. I, I, you know, I do believe that so much of this was like handheld and sort of random, but there are a couple shots in here that feel like very, very mapped, you know, especially like all of the shots with like Schindler and Ray Fiennes where they're sitting down in like identical armchairs facing off, just bracketing the screen, right. you know, one on each end, one on the other end. There's even this idea of, like, the two lists that you have. You know, the film opens with this chaotic scene of people trying to put their names on lists. And then at the end, there's a similar scene, only it's, like, Schindler's list, and he has restored order to the idea of a list. Like, here, mm. let's even just listen to the sound of the change. Itzak Hudas. Hudas. Itzak. Zucker Helena. Zucker Helena. Yes. Say your name clearly. We are the family Dresna. Yuda, Jonas, Donata, and Chaya. We are Rosners, Henry, Mansi, and Leo, and our son. I am Alec. So yeah, it's it's bracketed here. Even the scene where he goes to Rayfine's manor, which like they, they shoot this by the way. The villa. The villa. They shoot it like so, like up on the hill, a little yeah. Norman Batesian. Yeah. Which, like, I was, like, thinking of Psycho in that scene. And when they turn on the showers when they're in Auschwitz, it's, like, a very, like, look at the sprinkler turn on. Like, okay, I see where you're getting this. Anyway, but in that scene, like, you're it's shot through this window, through this window frame. And they're on opposite sides of this window frame with this giant, thick black bar, like, right in the middle. And then when he convinces him that he can transplant his factory, he moves over to, like, Rafe's side of the frame. And a lot of this stuff feels... Much more deliberate than I think he's saying. Well, don't you think he's like, it's in him? Mm. Like, you know, I don't think that you can, a sculptor will always kind of go back to what it knows, you know, and I feel like he's like never going to. trying to make a bad meal? Yeah, I don't think he could do it. I just don't <laughs> think he could do it. I, don't, I think that, he, like, even though it was handheld, it still looks Spielbergian. You know, it, 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 it's not like, it's not like Cloverfield. You know, he's not, <laughs> you know, he's not going to change his style that much, but I do think that these things are are built into him. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, if you're Steven Spielberg, you can't help making the choices that Steven Spielberg would make as much as you're making different choices to expand who Steven Spielberg is and who is a man and what is life and what is identity, which I guess is, you know, I'm open to that and I like that interpretation in a film that is about people making choices that are they in their nature or are they not in their nature? Yeah, this entire movie is about two people making choices and 
and how those choices are so different, but they're in the same boat. I mean, it's about two Nazis. Our leads of this movie are two Nazis. And I wouldn't say that Gert is the antagonist to Schindler because they're not at loggerheads. You know, they are in their perspective of the war and how they want to treat the Jews, but they're not like enemies, like, I'll get you, Oscar Schindler. You know, they basically leave in this amazing way that, you know, Gert gets rich and Schindler gets to save these people. You know, so it's people in an extreme situation, how you can break one way or break the other. Yeah, there's that scene where Oscar tries to explain Gert. And I want to asterisk this by saying I don't think oh. Oscar's correct, but we should listen to it. You have to understand, Gert is under enormous pressure. You have to think of it in his situation. He's got this whole place to run. He's responsible for everything that goes on here. All these people. He's got a lot of things to worry about. And he's got the war, which brings out the worst in people. Never the good, always the bad. Always the bad. But in normal circumstances, he wouldn't be like this. He'd be all right. There'd just be the good aspects of him, which <laughs> is a wonderful crook. A man who loves good food, good wine, the ladies, making money. Killing. He can't enjoy it. I mean, a couple of things. One, yeah. war brought out the good in Schindler. <laughs> he might have been the only... I think he's explaining himself. Do you think? One million percent. Like, ah. he's looking at himself and going, I'm, I'm, he's a man who likes to swindle, he likes good food, he likes good drink. That's Schindler. I like that interpretation. It makes a lot of sense because that explains his inability to think he likes killing. Right. Because that's not him. Right. Also, though, like, the film did take a lot of grief because apparently Gert was even worse than you see here. And here we see, like, a random psychopathic spree killer killing people from windows just because. Apparently, like, the camp had bodies hung up everywhere so if you were shooting this movie you would be seeing corpses in every frame um and apparently there's a big scene where they were in real life throwing babies out of windows and shooting them for target practice which spielberg gave interviews about saying he was not going to do that even with dolls like whatever he was not going to let that happen but it's that weird line of like what do you leave out and how bad this guy was and mind you, I'm just going to say, it. I do really, really like this movie. It sounds like yeah. I'm picking on it. I'm just sort of looking at it as a craft exercise of the yeah. things that, you know, in, in a three and an hour and 15 minute movie, you do shit that it's a little weird. Yeah. And, and one of those scenes is when Gert is in the buildup to beating up his maid for not reciprocating his feelings. And it has this strange kind of idea that he deeply, deeply loves her. Um, and the way that the scene works, like he's talking to her in a basement. He surprised her. She's in a slip where her nipples are showing, which kind of makes it a little weirder. It's a little bit like, why did you have that choice? Why wasn't she just in her maid clothes? Like, I get that it's like, make her look more vulnerable, but it's also like, hey, free nipples, you know? But the way that he has Ray Fiennes talk to her, he kind of just sounds like an awkward nerd trying to get a date. So, this is where you come to hide from me. Came to tell you that you, um, you really are a wonderful cook and a well-trained servant. I mean it. If you need a reference after the war, I'd be, uh, be happy to give you one. And yeah. Yeah, as that scene goes on, he's like stuttering and like I, awkward. I noticed that, and it, it, but I think, again, going back to what we were saying in the beginning, here's a man who wants respect, and the way he gets respect is through abuse right i mean whether it's shooting whether it's hitting whether it's just being a dick like that first clip that we heard where he's like close the fucking top and here he wants love and it's it's almost like his superpower is is gone here you know it's like he can't do that but then he inevitably does like he he grows so frustrated trying to elicit some reaction that he has to eventually beat her because he knows no other way to get someone to pay attention to him than to hurt them. And back to your other point about babies out of the window, you don't need it. You don't need it because there's nothing in this movie that would let you go like, well, I think he's an okay guy. How many examples do you need to see before you go, I, you know, 
you know, it's not a it's not a documentary on this character. And I think that that kind of restraint is important because you walk away here going, this man is a monster. Was he worse? Sure. Do we need to see that? Not particularly. Okay, it is guest time. And I am so excited to talk to our guest. We have Embeth Davidson here. She was Helen Hirsch, of course, Rafe Fiennes' maid in the film. Um, you might also recognize her from a million other terrific things. She's been in Matilda and Junebug and Mansfield Park by Centennial Man. She's done Mad Men. She's in Californication. She's in Fracture. She's amazing. Embeth, hello. Welcome to the show. You are a, a very new actress in the American eyes here. Like, how did Steven Spielberg find and cast you? He cast me. You know, do you remember in the old days they did those movies of the week? There was like a NBC would have their movie of the week. It was long before sort of all these um, cable, good cable channels and everything was just abc nbc cbs and and during sweeps they did a movie of the week and i got cast in the part of sort of this young bride of treat williams and he murders her after the first two hours but she was of some polish heritage and i think there was a line lois smith played my mother it was a really good cast lois smith played my mom and i say something one line in some polish thing so i guess Stephen notoriously watches everything and he, he was I was I'd just been living in the States for a year and he saw it and then <laughs> in typical sort of fashion of my life I guess on the Monday called my agency and said you know I, I really want to meet this girl and they said no she's not represented here <laughs> so then he he went around and called somebody again and then actually got in touch with me and that's how it happened. Well, you know, we actually just recently did um, Sophie's Choice, and it has never occurred to me how valuable for an actress it is to do a good Polish accent. Weird. I've never done one. I found it, you know, challenging, but completely different to do, considering sort of my accent. And at that time, I was focused on sounding like an American with an American accent. So it was easier for me with my accent to do that than it was to do an American or is to do an American so then where do you start in preparing to play Helen Hirsch? I mean, the screenplay was great. And, and Stephen was working with both Steve Zalian, but I think he also had um, Tom Stoppard wrote some sides as well. And he played around with the scene. So in the writing itself, if you actually read, it's almost one of those things that you could have done no other work on, but just gone to the script, which is rare in sort of something that has real history behind it, because it was so very well written, that monologue where... She talks to Liam's character and says how awful it is to, to live there. The, you know, the, the, getting to Poland helps a lot and sort of being in this kind of really bleak atmosphere and sort of being steeped in what was going on, being around Rafe, who was sort of very much in character playing his part. And then just reading, there was a lot. I remember going, t- catching a taxi in London to the Imperial War Museum and reading on the trial of, 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 uh, of Armand Gert and like, you know, his hanging and what came up in the trial and more information about her. But there was so much literally just in that monologue, I probably could have done it just from that. Now, did Rafe let his character drop ever between scenes or was he always in Garrett mode? He he did. He he did. He was, you know, Rafe is, Rafe's very intense. Rafe's got layers and layers and layers to him. So, you know, you'd catch a different glimpse of him. So he certainly wasn't walking around like Armand Goethe, but he was having to eat a lot. And there was, I'm sure, self-loathing with that and just having to keep that weight on. And he certainly wasn't cruel to me <laughs> offset, but he was, he was, he was very opaque. You couldn't, you couldn't figure out who Rafe was all the time. I mean, you've been on so many sets like before and after this. I'm curious about like what the tone was like on this specific set. Was the vibe different? It, you know, it was such a huge cast and such a colorful cast of different people. You know, there was Liam, who was newly in love with Natasha. So Liam's world was sort of Natasha and amazing bottles of red wine outside of work. And, you know, and, and, and I was seldom on set with Liam other than the day that we worked together. But there was Liam and then there was life on set and then there was life back at the hotel where we were all working. And then, you know, there was Rafe, who was always very serious. And then there were the amazing Israeli actors who were very colorful and very funny and always arguing with each other. And so there was that that group who, you know, when we did the Auschwitz stuff, it ended, some of it ended up being cut. But I'd spend hours and hours at night with, with some of them. So that was sort of, Stephen was in a very good mood. Stephen was actually very light. There were a couple of days that were because it was the nature of what we were shooting that were just, you know, nobody was sort of roaring with laughter and 
telling inappropriate jokes off set. It was very, it was quieter on those days, you know, when we were shooting the shower scene. When we were in Auschwitz, it was really, that was sort of almost the most serious and quiet. And we were all, it was so cold that we were all huddling in different areas to keep warm. So, but you know, Stephen was always the rock. Everyone could return to where Stephen was sitting on his chair at the monitor and deep, deep, wonderful conversation and very, you know, just very alive, amazing time. And then offset, actually a truly happy group of people and and you know just like a family people talk about that on set but that really was because we were like a lot there were a lot of children in that family and and it was a difficult thing to go through in some ways so everybody was was very connected I, well i love that and you're know, mentioning the shower scene like steven mentioned i think this summer that a couple of the other actresses i think it might have been a few of the israeli actresses had breakdowns shooting the shower scene yeah, because again, so historically, I think thinking of um, one of the ladies I know was born in one of those work camps. So I think for her to come back and sort of see what her mother had endured and for any, almost every one of the Israeli actors had family that were lost or family that were had lost somebody, you know, and distant relatives and closer relatives. And so for them... There's a, it's interesting because the Israelis don't like to talk about, or my Israeli friends don't like to talk about the Holocaust. The Holocaust survivors don't like to talk about it either. And so then you're an actress who's been steeped in this sort of silence, but ever present thing that has been a part of your culture and your family since you were born, and you're finally confronted and in it. I imagine that that was their experience and why that was their experience. It was different for me. It was awful. It was awful to be there and the, the, the sort of hideous, you know, the, everybody's naked. And so then I remember the smell of it, just this bodies, everybody's bodies in the thing and, and, you know, heat and, and then cold. And then, and just that, that it really was pretty scary and shocking. And Stephen sort of had the camera going and sort of captured lots of shots of people looking up and people huddled together and you didn't even know which, who the camera was on. And it wasn't hard to pretend that, you know what I mean? So I can imagine if that were me and my history and my family were all of that just sad because it felt weird and scary to be there that moment. So if that was your history, that would be even that much more intense. So then what was this like for you when the film came out? Because it's huge and everybody's talking about it and it's this juggernaut, it's winning all the Oscars and it must be exciting, but I'm imagining, you know, unlike if you're promoting La La Land, you're, it's, you're going to these big events, but it's not always... Yeah, it, it was, you know, it's so funny. It was so funny for that to be the first thing that I had really experienced at Hollywood via. Do you know what I mean? It was such an un, unexpected... I mean, I'm so, I'm so unprepared, so green, so... Oblivious to all of it. I remember when we arrived, we had the we had the Washington D.C. screening, and then that was like the world premiere, and it was the Museum of Tolerance or the Holocaust Museum there. And then we flew to New York, and there was less press at, in Hollywood. I think, I mean, in the, the Washington one, we sort of walked through somewhere, and then there was some photographers, and then we went into it. There wasn't sort of a an arrival, and I'll never forget arriving at the New York one. And I kind of wasn't aware of sort of the, I, I, because I was very young and, and so inexperienced in how things worked here. I didn't realize that it was a juggernaut I didn't, in, its, in its way. I didn't know that yet. And I remember sort of being getting ready and then getting in the car. And then as I stepped out of the car in New York, my, foot, my shoe fell off. <laughs> as I sort of put my foot out and sort of like my shoe was loose and I was like, oh God. And then this explosion of light bulbs. And, and then I sort of realized that night when, with the press that was there and with the, the party afterwards I, and then with as the reviews and stuff started to come out and people were sending them to me really realizing what that the film was really a huge success I remember my agent saying this is a really good this is a really successful opening weekend which I didn't I didn't know I mean but I'm picturing like because you at this time you had been in one other big movie for cult weirdo fans you know you'd been Sheila in Army of Darkness you know what? that just... came out it came out when Army of Darkness came out when I was shooting Schindler's I think and I, there was no opening I didn't go to one anyway I think I was possibly in Poland when it came out so and, and that was not received the same way right so that was like a little cult film and Sam Raimi was Sam Raimi but there was a he had a sort of an oddball following and I didn't I didn't even know what that was I'd just done that and thought 
is this what it's going to be like to make movies here? You know, the fake skeletons and all the way. I did not know. So Schindler's, I knew, I knew Spielberg, right? So for somebody quite green and not knowing about the business, like I knew it was the real deal. I knew, wow, we've been flown to Washington. We've been flown to New York. But in a lot of ways, I didn't understand until we were in the thick of it. Wow, this, this is really, really being well received, which was so nice. Well, so what has it been like talking about Schindler's List again this year? You know, you guys have been presenting it and doing sort of small discussions, you and Spielberg and Kingsley. You know, somewhat sort of bittersweet in in a way, lovely to see everyone again. It's like, again, I talk about it as the family and everybody fell into the sort of their place in the family. And it's sort of Liam was the big older brother and Caroline was this sort of happy sister and... Ben was the sort of serious uncle and Stephen was the dad and I was the young daughter. Do you know what I mean? It really, really always was that for me. And Janusz was always the sort of funny uncle and Rafe was the, you know, the, the star, the, the, the star child, the, the, the golden boy in a weird way. So it was all that on the external and then there was the subject matter and then there was actually seeing the film again, which really was sort of a gut punch for me. I... I wasn't expecting that because the reminders, there were things in the film I'd forgotten, you know, just some of the pieces that add together, the reason why people got, you know, um, not Armin Gert, Bill, uh, Ben's character ends up on the train and has to go and then gets pulled off the train. There were details, small details, but I'd forgotten sort of how exquisite the cinematography was. And I'd, I was again reminded almost with fresh eyes because 25 years later, you bring fresh eyes to it again reminded of, oh my God, Rafe was so good. So there was that and physically seeing the movie. And then there was the, the sort of one's relationship in time, you know, it's like we're all this much older with people have died and, and, you know, people have had children and people have gotten married and gotten married again. And so there's this personal thing, but this is a real constant. And it was, it was wonderful actually to dip into that time and see the film on a big screen and really sort of get to appreciate it with more objectivity and less ego to really appreciate what Stephen had done. I love that. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll throw uh, one more at you if that's okay. I'd like sure. to know, like, which scene for you was the most difficult to shoot? Interestingly, the, 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 scene, the scene with Liam, which was much wordier, was easier because words in some ways you know the words carried it that was such a well-written scene as what i was saying earlier is that that the, the emotion came with it the descriptions of it the you know liam the, the the setting of it everything the hardest thing to shoot was the one where i get beaten up by rafe mm -hmm. the first where he sort of sees her she's actually bathing the camera pans over and you sort of don't really see right the moment i'm I guess i'm washing under my arms i mean wearing a slip and which is quite transparent and my hair is wet, my face is wet, I'm washing my face. And then he comes down and starts talking to me. And it's that semi-seduction scene that then turns into this horribly violent thing. And both parts of it, the part where, you know, we tried different things. He put his hand up to my mouth. He put his finger in my mouth. He went to touch me. He didn't, you know, and Stephen edited it the way he wanted to. So that was really hard. And then, Following that is suddenly like this terrible, he goes, no, 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 you, you think you, I forget what the lines were, but you almost, you almost got me. And then he starts hitting her. And that was terrible too. You know, there's, there's something when you're doing that sort of a scene where you're not, you're not actually being hit, but you are sometimes. And so it was like, you know, for, for that one take, for the first slap, Stephen was like, can you take, you know, can you take a slap? Can you, because there's a thing when, when, you know, when you see a real slap, I'll never forget Kristen Scott Thomas did it with Rafe in The English Patient. When somebody really slaps you, it isn't a film slap where you turn your head away, right? Those came later in that scene. But the first one, you want to see the stunned thing where the face doesn't move and where the hand really connects on a face and the face matter moves around. And so we did that a few times, which was not fun. <laughs> You know, but, and I don't even know in the end, I can't remember whether he used that, but that, that physical stuff, and it was just hard. It was just hard to be, to be just, you know, penetrated in a way and then beaten and then sent on your way. And it was a difficult day. It was satisfying artistically, but it was a hard day. It was hard to shoot. Wow. Well, Ambeth, 
Ember, thank you so much for, for talking to us on Unspooled. We, uh, I can't say how much we appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Amy, we've talked a lot about how Schindler's is a movie that is very hard to be critical of because I think that whenever you do anything that is Holocaust related, you are also talking about something that affected six million people and 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 more and many, many more. But I still say that this is a movie and there are critics out there, so I am sure there might be a bad review or a hot take on this. And am I right or wrong? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, I actually pulled two. One okay. of them from a critic and one of them from esteemed playwright and filmmaker David Mamet. Our critic in question is Jay Hoberman from The Village Voice, okay. who really actually devoted a lot of time to working out his feelings with Schindler's List. He wrote this kind of infamous negative pan of the movie. Right. But then like later on, he and The Village Voice did kind of a special roundtable issue where he invited a bunch of people to come in, and they talked about it for like... 10 pages, basically, oh, wow. of print. I, I respect that as a critic. He wasn't just, like, coming in with the hot take. He right. was like, let's really wrestle with the material. Yeah. So here's what he wrote. From the depths of the ocean to the dark side of Neverland, from rural Georgia to occupied Shanghai, Steven Spielberg envelops creation like an infinite expanse of saran wrap. And then he asks, is it possible to make a feel-good movie out of the ultimate feel-bad experience? Wow. And he says that Spielberg, you know, he tries to be casual when Jewish people are shot, but he cannot resist this punctuating close-up of blood in the snow. He can't keep himself from using a cute little kid as a savior. He's kind of noticing all these little entertainment tricks that Spielberg cannot resist putting into this film. And he's, actually, he has a line. Unlike Schindler, the man of much control, Spielberg cannot override his instincts. He says the Jewish people have physical presence only on mass. They're ultimately victims or children. And that the please nods and satisfied smiles of the designated Jews in that last shot, they suggest a transport of underprivileged waifs acting worthy of a special trip to Disneyland. Ooh. Ooh. And then he calls uh, Sophie's Choice, by the way, a far more contemptible film. And in the roundtables um, section, in the later issue, this is my favorite quote of what he said, just because we were talking about this. Right. He said, as with Platoon, we are enjoined to see a film and understand, but understand what? Now, I think in hearing that out loud, it's kind of fascinating because I think some of the things that you and I responded to, some of the things that made this movie, I think, engaging are the things that he's against. And, and maybe he's somebody who feels like there can't be anything cinematic in a film about the Holocaust. And and for him to say that Sophie's choice is more contemptible, that means well, he doesn't want melodrama. So, I, you know, what does this critic want from a movie that is about the Holocaust? Yeah, he seems to be, I think, prickled by the fact that it tries so hard to entertain, which honestly is the thing that struck me not in a negative way, yeah. I think. It's complicated. What do you think? No, I totally agree with you. The scene where they try to execute that person and the gun... Uh, doesn't work, and then someone else takes out a gun, and that gun doesn't work, and then someone else takes out a gun, and that doesn't work. I mean, that's a comedy scene, but at the end of the day, it is a film, and I think that it's a respectful film, and when you leave, you feel the power of it. And any which way that you can tell a story that is palatable is good. I think that if you're just being hit with misery and trauma you shut off. And this movie, I think, keeps you engaged. It's three hours and 15 minutes long. It really helps you see it from a lot of different sides. Yeah, I mean, maybe what Hoberman was resentful of is when you have these moments, you feel the presence of Spielberg in the mm -hmm. film. You feel the presence of a director shaping the Holocaust. And maybe there's just something uncomfortable about that. Right. Like feeling that you're being fed the Holocaust instead of witnessing the Holocaust. But that's the difference between a documentary and a narrative feature. But I would even argue in a documentary, your director has a point of view. There is something, you know, watch newsreel footage if you don't want commentary. You know, I, I feel like whenever you put a lens on anything, you're telling a story. We talked about this in regards to the book. You know, Schindler is elevated. Maybe his wife had more to do with it than we know, but the way the book was written, narrative choices were made, and that's what we're kind of following. I don't think anyone would leave there going, they had some great jokes in Schindler's List. But, but they really did, and they're all there, and they're on purpose. Right, but I think, but I think, <laughs> Which but that's. I'm not mad at. I'm not mad at it at all, because obviously people like to watch this movie. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's the stealth reason that nobody can say out loud is that Schindler's List is really funny. I mean, 
I also just go back to the sense of the best dramas have some of my favorite jokes in it. And it's a tension reliever. To go back and forth between that, that push and pull, is who we are. I mean, you're not all a monster and you're not, not all a knight in shining armor. And I think that that's, again, what brings this character to life. And even in trying to, to describe it, the idea of somebody walking out of a Holocaust movie being like, well, that made me happy, is also impossible. That's, yes. It's an impossible scenario. But anyway, here's yes. what David Mamet had to say. David Mamet said, I do not like Schindler's List. And he calls it an example of what he says is emotional pornography. He says, it's not the Holocaust we're watching, it is a movie. And the people in the film are not actually being abused, they're acting out a drama to enable the audience to exercise a portion of its ego and call that exercise compassion. So here he's like questioning Spielberg's intentions of like making us feel good watching this. And he says, members of the audience learn nothing save the emotional lesson of all melodrama, that they are better than the villain. But he adds that the audience is not superior to, quote, those bad Nazis and that any of us has the capacity for atrocity just as any of us has the capacity for heroism. So I think he's going after the fact that um, he finds the Gert character just too evil mustache twiddling because he actually then comes in and compares Schindler's List to those old serials where girls are tied to train tracks. And he says, the Nazis are the waxed mustachioed villain and the Jews are the daughter, which means to him Schindler's List is an exploitation film. You know, I take a great uh, offense to that article because what he's saying ultimately in the beginning is that a movie that makes you feel is wrong, right? Like, I mean, what he's describing there is 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 the movie going experience. And, you know, we talked earlier about how Gert is a character that wasn't betrayed evil enough for some people. You know, and he's saying, well, now he's, he's too evil. It's like, I think, and in my life seeing a handful of Holocaust films, they're all through a different lens. And you, you'll see The Pianist is a very different movie than Life is Beautiful versus Schindler's List versus Sophie's Choice. They're all using this backdrop and they should be using this backdrop. It's an important time in our in our history. Yeah, and where I would disagree with Mamet on that yeah. is I think there is some incredibly emotionally complicated what would I do, maybe I wouldn't be a better person stuff in this movie. And to me, those scenes are when people are trying to hide in the camps and other Jewish survivors won't let them take their hiding Mm -hmm. place. There are a lot of scenes like that. There's like half a dozen little bits like that. The kid who even jumps into the porta potty out of desperation. And the other kids are like, you can't hide here. And those scenes to me are that emotional complexity because like, could this person get them killed? Are they kicking somebody out to get killed who's just like them? No better, no worse. You know, and... And what would you do? Would you be a better person? Would you have somebody come into your porta potty or under the floor hiding space when it could get you killed? I mean, it's it's all pretty heavy stuff, obviously. And so now here's my question that's so silly. I can't imagine there's a Simpsons about this. Absolutely there is. What? <laughs> what do you got for me, Amy? Uh, well, I pulled one from an episode we've actually talked about before. Mm-hmm. This is a pretty early episode. It's from the episode A Star is Burns, where Mr. Okay. Burns wants to make an ultimate movie about himself. Okay. This is from our episode two, because the movie he makes ends up being basically Ben Purr plus E.T. Oh, that's great. But this is how he pitches the movie he wants to be made about himself. Listen, Senior Spielbergo, I want you to do for me what Spielberg did for Oscar Schindler. Uh, Schindler es bueno. Senor Burns es el diablo. Listen, Spielbergo, Schindler and I are like peas in a pod. We're both factory owners, we both made shells for the Nazis, but mine worked, damn it. Now go out there and win me that festival. (laughs) All right, Simpsons did it. Amy, this movie essentially cleans up the Academy Awards in in, in every possible way. It, It kind of tops a year for Spielberg that is insane and creating Jurassic Park, which is kind of the next summer blockbuster, which continues these blockbusters. Schindler's becomes like this entry point or beginning of, I think, Spielberg entering into this new phase of his career where the blockbusters kind of go by the wayside and and he's making more interesting choices, maybe believing in himself a little bit more to tell more weighty films. I mean, but he isn't really slowing down. I mean, no. in the last year, he had both the uh, Ready Player One and also the Post come out. Yeah. And he's like, I gotcha. I'm still doing it. No, he's still doing it. And so it brings me to the question that we always ask. It's number eight on the AFI top 100 films of all time list. Does this film deserve to be in the eighth position. I think we both would agree that it belongs on the list, right? It's solid. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's more 
fun to watch than I remembered. I totally agree. <laughs> I was dreading watching this movie, and I found myself completely engaged by the performances. I'll go out on a limb and say this. I'll jump in with my hot take. I think it's a little bit too high to be in the top 10, because in the top 10, what I think the AFI should be representing are films that change the landscape of cinema. That's what I was about to kind of say, too, on that same note, is that I don't think Schindler's List has a rippling artistic influence. Right. Hopefully a social political one. A hundred percent. But films before this were made about the Holocaust, films after this were made about the Holocaust. I think this is Spielberg's film about the Holocaust. And and I think as far as Holocaust films, it's very good. Uh, I just don't know if it belongs in that top 10. I don't know exactly where I feel like it fits in the grand scheme, but I think the top 10 should be reserved for films that are uh, doing something just a little extra special. Well, on that hot take, hot take, <laughs> let's <laughs> Should we roll the die and see what we're talking about next week? Actually, Amy, let's not roll the die because I thought it might be very interesting that the holidays or the Christmas holidays are coming up, that it might be interesting if we watched a Christmas classic also on the AFI Top 100 list. And that, of course, is It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, I love this movie. I will happily watch this movie. Are you going to pay for the exorcism of the Zocahedron? Because I mean, now I'm getting scared. I feel like as long as we don't lie about the roles, I know we're accused about this a lot online, about lying about these roles. No, we are picking this because it's a, a special time of the year, and it's the only time to kind of do it right now. And I also feel like same reason why we picked Schindler's. It was back in the theater. So you I think— You suddenly got sublime stuck in my head, because now I'm like humming like, I don't practice Santeria, because I'm trying to think of what I can do to make this die not murder us. No, it's not going to murder us. We're going to watch It's a Wonderful Life. And if it does murder us, I'm sure there'll be an angel up there that will protect us from that. (laughs) I will do it. So next week, It's a Wonderful Life. You know, well, I have to admit something. I am the tiniest bit of a Grinch. I would not say that Christmas is my favorite holiday. I'm a Thanksgiving person, primarily. I also like Labor Day a lot. You know, I like the the low-key holidays. But... On that note, I feel like I would like my heart to be warmed. So kind of like what we did for the Rocky episode, I would love people just to call in with their thoughts, their memories, their feelings about watching It's a Wonderful Life. And if you're about to watch it for the first time, I'd love your fresh hot take, your your piping hot cider take on It's a Wonderful Life and just the holiday warmness that it brings out. So let's get movie cozy. Call in. We are, as always, 747-666-5824. That's 747-666-5824. Call in and tell us about your wonderful lives watching A Wonderful Life. Thanks again to our sponsor, Palm. Now, palm.com. Thanks again to Unspooled, sponsor for this week's episode, Palm. Now, again, what Palm is, if you want to go and run around and just listen to this podcast without having your phone with you, Palm will let you do that. It slides onto your wrist. You can decide what you want to connect to in the real world. Do you want your phone calls only? Do you just want Spotify? Do you just want your map so you don't get lost? That's what Palm is. It's all the things you want from your phone while you can leave your phone at home. Go to palm.com to check it out for yourself or go to your nearest Verizon store and enjoy the world. Hey, this is Arnie from the comedy podcast Hello from the Magic Tavern, a chat show I host from the magical land of Foon with my co-hosts Usador, the blue wizard and Chuck, the shapeshifter. Most weeks we interview adventurers, wedding planners, ambulatory trees but this week we have a special episode I am so excited to learn about the earth lore contained in Pride and Prejudice. We're gonna do a book club of Pride and Prejudice and you say this is a well-loved book on earth right? Yeah, it's one of those books that people love or were forced to read or more More likely, it's one of those I'm going to get to it. And some of our most beloved guests are returning to read the book with us and enjoy some drinks and food of a book club. We have Flower, we have Crom the Barbarian. And Germ. You know who they are. Maybe you don't give a crap about what an academic thinks about Jane Austen, but don't you want to know what a wizard and a badger think about it? Not enough spells. Not enough grubs. Not Not enough enough sword fights. fights. Whether you love Pride and Prejudice or have no interest in reading it and just want to listen to a book club go really off the rails, you'll enjoy this week's Hello from the Magic Tavern. We shall defeat this book! 